Good day and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special Gold Human Insight webinar on narrative medicine, a method for meaning and connection during this pandemic crisis. I'm Pia Pine Miller, Senior Director of Strategy and Business Development at the Gold Foundation. We are thrilled to be collaborating with Deepu Goda and Catherine Rogers, part of our ongoing work to promote practitioner well being and humanistic care. We're also excited to have so many partners, colleagues, and institutions with the Gold Foundation from all over joining us virtually. A few words about both Deepu and Catherine. Deepu Goda, MD, MPH, MS, is a general internist, the assistant dean for medical education, and the lead for narrative medicine at the Kaiser Permanente Tyson School of Medicine. The school will welcome its inaugural class later this year in July 2020. Kaiser Permanente is implementing an integrated four-year narrative medicine curriculum in the medical school. Dr. Goda monitors and provides general oversight for curriculum for the school. Prior to joining at Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Goda was at Columbia University for 20 years where he served on the board of directors for Columbia Narr Narrative Medicine, a role he still holds. Catherine Rogers, MFA, MS, is Associate Director and Lecturer in the Division of Narrative Medicine at Columbia University. Rogers has facilitated narrative medicine seminars in hospitals and universities such as Mount Sinai, Columbia Presbyterian, and Georgetown Hospital and School of Medicine. She currently facilitates the Special Columbia University Narrative Medicine online sessions in response to COVID. She is a two-time Fulbright Fellow, in addition to being both a playwright and performer. This webinar was created with Deepu and Catherine to provide greater insights on how to connect and find meaning during COVID-19 using narrative medicine as a framework. We are so thankful for their work and wonderful collaboration with us here at Gold. Thank you so much, Pia. Pia, I want to thank you so much. Um, so if if we if we could put the slide back on real quick. If you want to advance to the next slide, please. Um, so Pia, um, Catherine and I want to thank you and the Gold Foundation for welcoming us. This is truly an honor to support the Gold Foundation in their efforts to respond to the COVID pandemic. We think that the, uh, the narrative medicine program and the work that we're doing has an important role in, in supporting our, our healthcare workers uh, across the fields um, in, in staying balanced and staying healthy during this time. So neither Catherine and I have any disclosures. So if you wanna to advance to the next slide, please. So what is narrative medicine? So uh, as, as Pia mentioned, this is a, a field that both Catherine and I have been engaged with in for a while. And it's something that has deeply impacted our own careers. Um, I started being engaged with narrative medicine back in 1999 when I was an intern and resident at Columbia University. My very first month of internship was doing an elective in narrative medicine with the director of narrative medicine, Rita Sharon. We spent time reading poetry, writing about our lives, writing about patient care. And I realized then that the opportunity to reflect on one's practice, to think about patient care, to think about the, the rigors of taking care of patients is important for developing community and being able to grow as a physician. So I think this is something I realized very early on that, that is important for medical students, residents, as well as, as practicing physicians and healthcare teams. I've continued to be involved in the field of narrative medicine I'm on the board of directors for Columbia Narrative Medicine. And as Pia said, uh, last year I moved out to California to help start the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine. 
And I'm very proud to say that we've incorporated narrative medicine across all four years, recognizing that engaging with creative works, being able to write and support each other in this process is an important part of becoming a physician. So what is narrative medicine? Uh, it's a, a branch of health humanities that was founded at Columbia University in the late 90s with a particular methodology that is supported by literary studies, philosophy. It's supported um, by psychoanalytic thought and has a particular methodology where we ask groups to engage closely with creative works, poems, short stories, film, it can be dance, it can be visual art. And another important methodology is we ask people to write. We ask people to write in groups. So the question is, why do we do this? Why is this important for medical students? Why is this important for residents and people in practice? We think that there's several outcomes or dividends that come out of the work in narrative medicine. I wanna outline them for you. They're, they're listed there. The first is attention. So when we work in groups and we ask people to look closely at a poem, let's say, and they're paying attention to the words, what do the words mean? The mood, the narrative arc, uh, you know, what is said, what isn't said. What we're doing in that instance is we're training and developing skills of attention, the basic currency we need to engage with the world and what's needed for patient care. And we develop our attention in different ways when we engage with the poem versus when we engage with visual art. The second thing that's happening is what we call representation. So what we ask groups to do is to write. And the writing that we do in narrative medicine, um, especially in our typical workshops, is pretty short. We ask people to write in three minutes, four minutes. The writing doesn't give people a chance to plan and develop an outline but rather put the pen on the page and trust where that pen will take them. So the writing is actually a process of discovery. We're asking the participants to not put on the page what they already know, but use the writing as an opportunity for discovery. Writing is also important because when we put things on the page and write about things that are meaningful, uh, we start to make sense of our lives. We start to make sense of our world and in doing so, we also develop a greater acuity for being able to observe our world. The third dividend or our outcome is what we call affiliation or relationships. So when we do this work in groups and people write about things that are meaningful to them and they share that writing with their colleagues and the colleagues then receive and listen to those writings with curiosity and presence and respect, what happens is that risk-taking is met with, with trust and, is, is met is, and that allows the development of stronger relationships. People learn things about one another they didn't know before and that allows a strengthening of, of connections between people. So we think affiliation or relationships is an important dividend. And the last point I wrote down there is creativity. You know, we oftentimes think about creativity as something for writers or dancers or musicians or, or visual artists. But we actually think that creativity is a necessary part of being an effective physician. And when we engage with creative works, when we're writing together and we're honoring the writing that people do as texts that are worthy of analysis, that are worthy of consideration, we are enhancing one's own capacity as a creative entity. And we know that when a patient is in front of you, in front of a clinician, when we're thinking about the challenges of a clinic or a healthcare system, we have to tap into our creativity to find appropriate solutions and respond to the thing that's in front of you and not just go back to solutions that were appropriate for the past. So these are methodologies that we've implemented um, in medical schools and residency programs and in interprofessional healthcare settings as well. And uh, 
we're excited to share a little bit of, you, of, of this methodology with you today. Um, so I wanted to hand this over to Catherine, who might be able to discuss you know, the work that she's been doing recently and, and uh, how narrative medicine has impacted her own work and also thinking about what we will experience today together. Thank you so much, Deepu. Um, as has been said, I'm a playwright and a performer. You know, when I moved to New York City after my heavy training, getting my MFA in Texas and playwriting, I came with an intuition um, and a belief that science and art belong side by side. Mm. Well, the great scientific discoveries come from a combination of rigorous science and taking a creative leap. Uh, on the other side, the great works of art come from creative abandon, but also from rigorous, disciplined study of technique. So me, as a writer of stories and trained in literary analysis, I knew I had been trained to see that people are made up of stories, and each person has many stories, and each story has many layers. And with all that complexity, it takes both creativity and scientific rigor to give and receive stories with adequate attention. And so that's where medicine came in. Dr. Rita Sharon, one of the founders of narrative medicine, the care of the sick, she says, unfolds in stories. So in 2011, I was delighted to discover that Dr. Sharon had in 2009 opened up the master's program in narrative medicine, inviting not only clinicians and medical students, healthcare professionals, but also artists like me into a field that aims to develop what Deepu had been talking about, the capacity in us to recognize stories, to absorb them, metabolize them, interpret them, and be moved to action by them. You know, as Dr. Sharon told the National Endowment of Humanities, bridging the chasms between the arts and sciences quite remarkably improves the care of the sick. And it, 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 that's a nice idea, but it's not just a nice idea, it's real. And in narrative medicine, I see it when I work with hospitals and universities, medical schools, even English departments across the US and abroad facilitating workshops like the ones that we're going to see here today. We found that narrative medicine is particularly valuable in this time of COVID when many of the old ways no longer hold, when both scientific rigor and creativity must cooperate at an unprecedented pace to find solutions to problems we've never even seen before. So, you know, as you know, stress is high right now among patients and families, but also among the clinicians themselves. Can narrative medicine help? Yes, research shows that narrative training does help. Research shows that it helps medical students increasing their self-awareness, increasing what they're able to learn and comprehend and value about their individual patients. Research also shows that narrative medicine can improve clinician teamwork and decrease emotional exhaustion and burnout. Given such a need in the time of, of COVID, we at Narrative Medicine have increased the re reach of our sessions. Overnight, we launched these online sessions uh, and offering uh, the general public free access. And we'll share a link to those sessions at the end of today's presentation. So for today, Deepu and I are trained facilitators from the master's program in narrative medicine at Columbia University. And you know, at the end, we will show you some opportunities for those interested in this kind of training. Today, we are gonna do a short version of a typical narrative medicine session. We will bring in a small group. As Deepu said, we'll read and reflect upon a text then we'll ask the group to free write to a prompt, and then they'll share with us what they wrote. So we'll have a chance to practice those movements of narrative medicine that Deepu mentioned before, attention, representation through writing, affiliation, building bonds. And for those of you viewing the webcast, we invite you to participate along with us. 
Um, you won't need much. All you need is something to write with. We will invite the group in in a moment, but first, uh, just want to point out three things about our sessions. One is we're not therapists, neither Deepur nor I, and this is not therapy. We are not giving advice. But and many people have found that the sessions can be therapeutic, sometimes providing comfort and relief and solace for participants. Uh, secondly, there is no hierarchy around the mat narrative medicine table. We leave our degrees and experiences at the door, and we're all experts around this table. We're all equal. And finally, privacy. You know, normally we held these, we hold these sessions um, in private rooms, in small groups. But today, as Deepu said, we have permission from all the participants to air this session publicly. And of course, in our private sessions, we would normally ask that what is said in the room stay in the room. So with all of that being said, now is the time we would like to welcome our guests today, the seven participants in our Narrative Medicine Workshop. And as they're coming in the door, we'll just introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, you will be meeting Jonathan Chow. He's a graduate of Columbia's Narrative Medicine Master's Program, a graduate of USC School of Medicine, and now he is a psychiatry resident at Mass General in Boston. You'll be meeting Walter Conwell, a pulmonary and sleep physician and the Associate Dean for Equity, Inclusion and Diversity at Kaiser Permanente Tyson School of Medicine. Sally Huang is a graduate of Columbia's Narrative Medicine Master's Program. She's about to graduate from Baylor College of Medicine in Texas and will begin her psychiatry residency at Stanford in June. Andre Lejoy is Associate Program Director at York Hospital Family Medical Medicine Residency Program, Family Medicine Residency Program in Pennsylvania. He is also a graduate of Columbia University's Certificate Program in Narrative Medicine. Thank you, Catherine. Um, you will also meet Natalia Romano Spica. She's a graduate of Columbia's Narrative Medicine Master's Program and is now a medical student at Drexel University College of Medicine. Rebecca Roop is joining us. She is a nurse midwife, a faculty member at Columbia University's nursing program, and the director of Columbia's midwifery program. And we'll also meet Chris Travis, a graduate of Columbia's medical school and master's program in narrative medicine, and is now an OBGYN resident at USC in Los Angeles. Um, welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see your faces and have a chance to uh, have this workshop experience with you. So if you would please advance the slide. Great. Um, so what we're gonna do together is we will read a poem together. Um, and after the discussion of the poem, uh, we'll have a chance to then write, write to a prompt, and then after we've written, have an opportunity to share what we've written with each other. So a couple ground rules um, with respect to just, you know, delving into the poem itself, and I'll, I'll facilitate the first part, reading the poem together, and Catherine will, will facilitate the section on writing and then reading what we've written. With respect to the poem, as, as Catherine said, um, you know, as you're following along in the recording, or if you join a workshop like this, uh, you know, we put our degrees aside and hierarchies aside. What's wonderful about creative works is that creativity is a part of every culture throughout the world. It's meant for people, not meant for specialists. Um, and we come to a poem, we come to a painting as equals. It's a place that we can just grapple with and think about the lived experience, you know? So that's what we invite you to do if you're reading, if you're watching along at home and for the participants here is, is put self judgments aside um, and just enter the poem and enjoy yourself. Poetry sometimes can be intimidating for people. You wonder like, what is this about? Am I supposed to get it? Um, 
And what we ask you to do is when you read the poem and, and say it out loud and, and, and think about it, is just to inhabit the poem, walk around, you know, walk around the poem. Uh, what do the words mean? Take your time. Uh, the work is supposed to slow you down. So take your time with it. If you're confused about a word or a passage, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, the work's supposed to have you scratch your head a little bit and think about, well, what could this mean? It allows multiple meanings. Um, so those are some of the gifts of working in, with, with creative works. Um, and they're also a part of the normal and expected part of engaging with a great creative work is it doesn't give you answers. Oftentimes it just poses more questions and ways to, to think about, about your lives. So, so with that, what we're gonna do with the poem, um, and we'll show it in a second, is we'll read it out loud. And if you are, you know, uh, if, if you're watching this recording later, um, practice actually saying the poem out loud. Poetry comes from a great oral tradition where words were said out loud to yourself and, and, and to others in a room. Um, so go ahead and say the poem out loud. See how the, the words sound and feel to, to your ears and to your body. So we'll read the poem twice. I'll ask for a volunteer to read it once, and then we'll read it again. And if we were doing this workshop um, in person, we would actually print out the poem on a page, on a physical page, um, and would ask you to actually take a pen and start to mark it up while you're listening, while you're reading, to actually engage with the physical thing that the poem is on the page, right? Um, but in, in this situation, we're going to be putting the poem on the screen and reading out loud and participating. So with that, could I get a volunteer to read for the first time our, our poem that we can go ahead and place the poem up. Thank you. Um, so could I get a volunteer to read the first time? I can volunteer. Okay, Natalia, please. Days by Philip Larkin. What are days for? Days are where we live. They come, they wake us, time and time over. They are to be happy in. Where can we live but days? Ah, solving that question brings the priest and the doctor in their long coats running over the fields. So take that in, look around. What words do you find interesting that jump out at you, that confound you? Are there connections between words that you see there? Okay, let's, let's read it again. Um, and this time, you know, also think again about, you know, if you were to circle something, what words would pop up? If you were to bracket something, if you were to draw arrows, um, where are the connections? Does it change somewhere? Um, think about pivot points, turning points. Okay, let's ask someone else to volunteer to read this poem. I'm happy to volunteer. Okay, Walter, please. Days by Philip Larkin. What are days for? Hmm. Days are where we live. They come, they wake us, time and time over. They are to be happy in. Where can we live but days? Hmm. Ah, solving that question brings the priests and the doctors in their long coats running over the fields. Thank you, Walter. Um, so pretty compact poem, right? Um, there's a lot going on in there. So what, where did you all go with this? Were there any words that, that you circled? <clears throat> um, for me, I think there was something happening the word days itself. And uh -huh. Um, typically, when I think of a day, I think of a period of time, like 24 hours, but mm. 
there's something in this poem that made me think of a day as a space. Um, Interesting, yeah. Of it being a place itself. So when he says days are where we live, um, where can we live but days? It's a where and not just a when. Mm -hmm. um, and also the line there to be happy in. I think all those things are more like spatial um, references. Yeah, so it, it, it's a... It's, it's wild to think about days as time and space. So really kind of getting you to, to change your thinking about how to even conceptualize what the days are. I want, thank you for bringing that up. And it's a refrain over and over again, right? So we're, it's repeated how many times in the title, in the first line, the second line, and it comes back again at the end of the first stanza. So, and there's something about that repetition also that, that mirrors what they're saying, what what Larkin is saying about days coming time and time and time over. So just kind of repetition of days in the poem that mirrors that concept of space and time. Thank you, Sally. The the um, I like this concept that they wake us. What are days for? They wake us, and we yeah. can and we can count on it that they come time and time over. And I thought that was an interesting, uh, and really something to look forward to, uh, which is uh, a challenge, you know, when you think about the current context, um, the challenges that we look forward to each day. Yeah. These days come and wake us, and we can count on that. That's interesting. So, so when you see that word wake us, that had kind of a positive connotation for you, Andre? Yeah, uh, but you can also think about the uh, wake of a pandemic and uh, mm -hmm. the power in that mm -hmm. and uh, where that might take you in the course of the day in time or in space. Mm -hmm. So that idea of wake can be thought of in multiple ways, right? So, so the wake is in wake us up. Um, and of course, we bring ourselves into every text that we, that we read and we bring our current history into it. Um, so right now, wake has a different significance for us, the wake of the pandemic. Absolutely. And we can think of wake in other ways, too, as in, you know, wake us up from slumber uh, in terms of how we are engaging with our lives. Thanks, or it can, um, you know, sort of awaken some of that history that we bring, you mm -hmm. know, our own story that we bring and, mm -hmm. and, and be seen with a different perspective. Nice. Yeah, the uh, that phrase "wake us" um, also stood out to me, and in some ways, it um, it complicated the idea of days as rooms, um, which Sally had brought up. Yeah, um, because it posits days as subjects um, as well as spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's complicated and it also adds to this idea of days as periods of time um, and I began to think about um, days as bodies or bodies as also things that live in time and space and are also subjects and are mm -hmm. bodies as days and the fact that we wake up in our bodies um, and we're awoken to our body yeah uh, and I think that is perhaps relevant to the practice of medicine or healthcare in general in some way. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Days becomes personified. You could imagine this day, the days coming and gently kind of waking us up time and over. So we have this idea of the days as personified as space and time. Um, so really, as you said, really kind of complicating that, that, that idea. What do y'all make of the, the line time and time over? It's sort of a strange way of saying a very familiar thing. I think the phrase is usually time and time again. Yeah. Um, so we know what it means, but it sort of makes the familiar strange. I think the same thing happens with, uh, in the second, um, little paragraph, ah, solving that question. We answer questions, we solve problems. We know what the, you know, <laughs> we think we know what it means, but it, it's, a, it's not quite a hiccup 
but it it makes you stop and think a little bit more than saying it in a more conventional way and it's the same thing with the poem overall what are days for well, of course we know what days are for yeah and then it gives us something slightly different you know where can we live but days do we live in days well i guess we could live in nights Mm -hmm. but night is a part of a day or maybe something broader than a day like a week or a year it, I think so much of the structure of this poem causes us to sort of reimagine what these really familiar concepts are and what they might mean mm -hmm. really nice Chris um, I think that's one of the things that the poem does for us it takes something very familiar and makes it odd and I'm really glad that you brought those two lines to our attention time and time again. Well, that's what rolls off our minds and on our tongues, and yet time and time over. So what is the overdoing? And, you know, we usually say answer the question or solve the problem, and that's mixed up too. And those are opportunities for us to kind of examine them a little bit more closely and say, what's going on there? What's, what's, why that little trip? Um, and we can think of time and time over in an interesting way, because it is time and time again. Um, but time over also means the ending of time. It's done, it's over. So it suggests this kind of cyclical nature of days, but also suggests, gosh, when the day ends, what then? And if, it's, if, you're living, if you're not living in days, then where do you live? Do you live in the night? Is that possible? And is the day something more than just a time of day, but rather, a period of life and then afterlife. And you brought our attention to that second stanza, Chris, that I want us to delve into that's fascinating. Um, what do you all notice about the sec second stanza that feels a little different than the first? It well, seems. Oh, uh, with Rebecca. So Want to go with Rebecca and then Walter? Okay, uh, thanks. I I had jotted down uh, a few things because I was missing that physical interaction with the poem. So solving that question was something that I, I jotted down and underlined and thought uh, the same as Chris was bringing up about what more that brings to the question. Mm -hmm. uh, solving uh, the complexity rather than just simply I know the answer. Um, yeah. And the, what I also noticed about that stanza is that the day is now, there is no instance of day in that second stanza. It's yeah. one uh, continuous thought that really is trying to answer that question, where do we live at days? Yeah. Uh, really blows it up, really broadens it significantly. And um, particularly, I think that was reinforced for me running over the fields as I heard that being read both times, I really felt the expanse of it, mm -hmm. the vastness of it. Yeah. And um, I think I think I'll stop there to leave time for others. That's so nice, Rebecca. Just note like that second stanza, um, you said is just a long answer to that the question that ends the first stanza. Um, notice the punctuation. It's all one long sentence quite different than how that first stanza works. And it has a particular effect on us as readers. Um, we read the poem, we speak the poem out loud, and as we do so, we rush into that second stanza. Ah, solving that question brings the priest and doctor in their long coats running over the fields. We're out of breath at the end of that, just as the priest and doctor have been running over the fields. Um, and it increases the pace of that, of that stanza. Um, you know, we usually solve problems, we solve mathematical problems, you know, we answer questions. So kind of weighing those two kind of possibilities, what comes to mind for me is um, there's a kind of certainty that might be related to solving something, solving an equation, solving a, a mathematical problem, as opposed to, you know, positing an answer to a question They may have multi multiple uh, answers. That's one thing that comes up for me is what do the priest and doctors say about certainty um, that they're solving that question as opposed to positioning answers. Um, Walter. 
Um, to go, well, my thought was very similar. I thought the second stanza really provided additional context. Um, the choice of, uh, there are a lot of individuals, a lot of professions that uh, could have been added, but the choice of the priest and the doctor I thought was interesting. Uh, so just pos uh, positioning the science with uh, faith, uh, science with spirituality, you know, recognizing um, that on the surface they may be very separate, but um, the next line in their long quotes creating some similarity between, between the two. So I, I thought that uh, it really provided additional context um, particularly to that question, where can we live but days, uh, bring in both science as well as uh, faith. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Walter. So um, let's, you know, I, I would like us to kind of end in that place in our analysis of the poem, which is it takes us this very seemingly simple, almost childlike question, what are days for, um, takes us to deep existential quandaries of what happens after the day is over. Um, and who is there to help us answer that question? We have spiritual, religious teachings in the priest, and we have science, you know, personified by the doctor there with their coats. And, you know, think about the imagery that's going through your mind, these coats running over the hills. Um, in my mind, I'm looking at these two people running over the fields in their long coats, it's not very easy to run in a long coat. <laughs> we all know that. So it's almost this, this clumsy kind of image of, of the priest and the doctor running over the fields in search of being able to, um, you know, being able to answer or solve that question that's almost comical um, and, and, and trying to answer um, or provide a solution for this uh, ever, ever present question for us, what, what is there but the days? Where can we live but days? Um, so you see this incredibly compact poem expanding into uh, deep questions. Uh, I think this, this is what's possible in, in a great poem like this by, by Philip Larkin. I wanna thank you all for exploring that with me. Um, I wanna hand it over to Catherine who will take us to the next part of our workshop. Oh, all right, thank you, Deepu, and everyone for those wonderful, rich observations and the great variety of uh, things that were noticed. So for the second part of our workshop, and I'll ask the slide to be uh, advanced in a minute, but before that, uh, now we're gonna do some writing. And it's not English class writing, we're talking about free writing. I'm gonna time just three minutes in a, in a in a longer session, we would normally write for four minutes, but today I'll time you for three minutes. I'll ask you to freely write whatever comes to mind. Um, and even if you get stuck, when I get stuck, I usually write, I'm stuck. The light is shining in my face and I don't know what to do and then keep writing. So whatever comes to mind, there's no wrong way to do it. Um, I am going to give you a prompt to get started. And, and time you and, and bring you all back to listen to each other's writing when the time is up. So if we can look at the next slide, there will be our prompt, write about the days that brought you here. Write about the days that brought you here. And respond to that any way you like. There's no wrong way to interpret it. And of course, people at home, please write along with us. We'll all mute ourselves right now for three minutes, but we're still with you.
take about another minute. and find a way to bring your writing to a close. Okay, as we bring the writing to the close, to a close, we can ask to take the slide away and uh, we can all see each other and we'll ask uh, for volunteers to read what they've written. Now, usually in a small group, everybody gets a chance to read, but in the interest of time today, we'll hear maybe from one or two people. Um, we're going to ask you just to read what's on your page with no prefacing. That's the narrative medicine mantra, no prefacing, just read what's on your page. You know, often though, when we write freely, something may come out that we didn't expect and possibly aren't ready to share. And that's perfectly fine. You can still read uh, whatever part you're willing to share and just skip over anything that you'd like to keep private. Also, nobody is forced to share. It's, it's all volunteer and it's all up to you. Um, and, and as uh, the person reads their writing, each of us is gonna listen very intently just as we listen to the poem and we will let the writer know what stood out for us, what we noticed, and, and how that writing affected us. What we do is really concentrate, as we did on the poem, on the craft of what we heard, how it was made, what words stood out. But what we don't do is press the writer for any personal details, you know, ha what happened when your, that happened to your grandmother. We stay away from that, we focus on the writing itself. And if you're watching at home, uh, when we're, uh, you can feel free to read what you've written to one another. So who would like to be the first volunteer to read? I can read. <laughs> Sally, thanks, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Sally. There is a photo of me as a child in China wearing a strawberry sweater and holding an old fashioned phone to my ear. I'm looking at the photographer and I don't smile. Today I'm sitting in the bedroom of my childhood home, cheerful curtains and sunlight streaming in. It's my 27th birthday. I'm smiling now. I'm gonna break my, my uh, uh, notice not to say anything personal and say happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> But now we'll respond to the writing itself and the things that struck us. Um, I'm just going to say uh, one thing and then open it up. Uh, I noticed right away when you said child and China, uh, the assonance, the sound, it sounds the same. And I think I was listening to it in the shadow of the poem we just read. So I was listening with my poetry ear, even though what you wrote seems to be prose. So thank you. Please just unmute and respond to Sally and what you heard. Yeah, I, I like the alliteration to um, uh, Sally, and um, I like how you brought your story, your history uh, in, into the poem, how, how Larkin's poem um, awakened that for us. Thank you. I was really struck by the colors in the writing. Uh, I cannot just unsee the strawberry sweater image and how it almost magnetically attracts the light coming towards it and how the light continues even many years later to go towards maybe that same sweater, even if it's not there, um, it's still kind of underneath, still there. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I noticed the sort of diptych kind of structure where in two parts, um, the sort of 
photo and then you now in the um, in your room and um, in some ways you could understand the sort of middle point as a mirror but also potentially like a portal and uh, thinking about Arundhati Roy's uh, recent essay on the pandemic as a portal into some kind of new uh, reality. Um, it's just interesting to think about the relationship between the past and the present. Yes, Jonathan, I, and uh, the way time was used between the past and the present. There's the photo sitting there, which is a, a time in the past, and yet the writer is, also, is sitting, the narrator is sitting there in the, the, narrate, the narration's present and the way it plays with time in that way as well. In a, a normal session, we would have many more responses to what Sally just gave. Um, in the interest of time, we're just gonna ask for one more volunteer to read and a few responses uh, before we'll have to wrap up the session. So, can we ask for one more volunteer? Go ahead. Great. Labor and delivery, waking by alarm or to cries, to feed, swaddle, or console, or to run full speed to the bedside of a woman who might die if I don't, oversleeping, sleeping in, all-nighters, early rising, wasted time, quality time, time apart, time together, time out of joint, quarantine, purgatory, purging, binging, fasting, feasting, fellowshipping, residency, moving, arriving, departing, forgiving, and of course, forgetting. Thank you so much. Again, I really see the shadow of the poem. Or, 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 so many possibilities, so many contradictions and opposites, all of it there together. You hold it there together in what sounded to me like a poem. What else did you hear in Chris? Yeah, I, I like how you set us up with your, you know, with, with your day, you know, the day of OBGYN uh, on the labor hall and the things you notice and experience, but then you come with this litany of words, this litany of options, one after the other. And uh, I could, I was just so impressed with how many uh, options you gave us. Um, very, very moving. Uh, and, and not just the moment, so many moments uh, in that day. Thank you. And let's just take one more comment before, unfortunately, we'll have to move on. I think in, in the shadow of, of the days, the poem that we just read, what I, what I really felt through Chris's um, writing was sort of echoed a thing I was feeling about days is that they can, they are more than something we, we do with, they, they contain us. And so as all these words kept coming out, I sort of saw them piling up and being contained um, in days in our lives. So um, just I, Pro, for a moment ran the risk of feeling a bit overwhelmed by all of these options until I realized that they can all be contained. And it was something uh, reassuring that I kind of came to that conclusion after all of these, these uh, different things he was providing us in terms of, of days. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and that uh, idea of containment. You know, it's something we see in a larger context in what we do here in this room, that we come and we contain ourselves within the confines of a poem or a painting or a piece of music. We reflect upon it, and we begin to bond with each other in that reflection. Um, it's just been a privilege to share this with all of you, uh, seven of you today. Uh, thank you so much for coming here and for so generously um, entering into this exchange. So for now, Deepu and I are going to bid you panelists goodbye, and we'll see you out there in the narrative medicine world. Thank you again. Thank you, you so much for joining us. This was a really great experience with you. Bye-bye. Great to see you all.
Thanks, everyone. Um, and Deepu, I'll turn it back to you just to reflect on what just happened. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, you know, uh, first of all, your 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 facilitation of, of the writing was was beautiful. Um, you know, just, just thank you for your attention to people's stories and their writing and and even the connection between what they wrote and the poem that, that we just experienced. Um, you know, first of all, what a great poem. Um, you know, we 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 come across uh, great works of art every now and then that really speak to us that we can go back to that continue to kind of allow us to see the world with greater clarity. And I think uh, Larkin's days is one of those. Um, you know, it, it's, it's also surprising to me that we can read a poem like that so many times. And if you experience it, engage with it authentically, you will see something new each time. It will have a different significance for you. It's kind of a lens that you take and you look at what you're currently experiencing now with that lens and it gives you a different view of whatever you're experiencing. And that's one thing that came up for me when I read this again with the group is how wonderful that is. Um, and also I wanna just kind of reflect on what just happened with the group. Um, in such a short amount of time, in such a small, you know, this compact poem, um, we accomplished so much as a group. We looked at formal elements of punctuation, of kind of pace and speed of the poem. Um, we talked about multiple meanings of the word days and could it be space, could it be time, could it be personified? Um, you know, we started to grapple with larger existential questions of what is this simple question of days actually getting us to think about about life and death. Um, we started to then discuss, you know, what, what role does science and religion have? Do, can they provide us answers? Um, I think these are all amazing places that we went to in a very short amount of time. I was also struck by the fact that we arrived at that place through a collective process. It wasn't one person who said all this, I learned something from Rebecca, something from Walter, something from Jonathan, something from Sally, something from Chris, Andre, Natalia. Each of them added to my understanding and my experience of that poem, and we did it together. And I think that's something that is really um, special and important about the work that, that we do in narrative medicine, where the poem becomes that third object in the room that we can draw our attention to and it can be a point of connection for us. Um, also reflecting on, on the writing, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, you, you gave the, you know, our guests three minutes to write and look at what's possible in three minutes. That's what always strikes me is that what comes off that pen onto that page, if, we're, if we allow ourselves the freedom to go and trust that pen can, can take us to places of discovery. Um, the poet Murray Howe says, the writing of a poem is an experience. It's not a record of an experience. Even if, it's, even if you're writing about a memory, the writing itself is an experience. And that's true for poetry. And I think that's true for what the, the work that our, our group just did. Um, as, as, uh, as Sally wrote about a childhood experience and memory, that was not simply a recording of a past occurrence that was a new experience that she had where she connected that past to her present and gave it form through the language and on the page. Um, and what was wonderful there in that experience is everyone's close listening to one another. People were recognizing the assonance like you mentioned, the alliteration, the colors that Natalia saw in Sally's work. Um, so what this requires us to do is honor one another's writing as a text that the stories of our lives are as important as you know, the book, the stories contained in that book on that shelf. Um, and the book on the shelf is really a tool for us to engage more deeply with the stories of our own lives. So I think that's what's happening here. Um, I think our, 
guests learn things about one another they didn't know before, even if they had been old friends. And I think they learn things about themselves that they didn't know, um, you know, prior to this session. And I will, you know, add myself to that list of people too that learn things about my colleagues and friends that I did not know before. So as we talked about before, Catherine, um, this is a deep part of the culture at Columbia University where you know, you are now as a faculty member where you trained, where I trained and was for many years. It's deeply informed the medical school there. Uh, it's a deep part of the culture in the medical school that we are creating at Kaiser Permanente. And, you know, what I have found in my own training as a physician is that the rigors of training, the rigors of clinical practice are serious. They take its toll emotionally physically, psychically, spiritually. Um, and we need opportunities to make sense of what we're experiencing. And that is absolutely true in the current era of, of coronavirus. It's, uh, I think it has affected healthcare workers around the globe in very deep ways. I think we will only, we've only begun to understand the way that's impacted health, healthcare workers um, and I fear that the sequela and impact of this uh, will be long lasting. And this is a type of global trauma. And in those situations, uh, we've learned from other experiences of people experiencing trauma, there is a need to narrate our experience. There's a need to be able to give words and voice to what we're experiencing and to have someone on the other side be a witness to us. And that's part of what we hope that this work can provide is opportunities for people on the front lines, taking care of patients, being part of that healthcare team, to be able to give words to their own experience, to be able to serve as witness to their own and their colleagues' experience. So in this small way, I hope that our narrative medicine work, you know, can help um, us make sense of and even heal from this experience. Um, and I know for you, Catherine, you know, creativity is a big part of your life. Um, and I wanted to just kind of hear from you about, uh, you know, creativity in your own life, about how the people watching this video might engage with creative works um, in their own lives to kind of make sense of what's going on and maybe even hear a little bit about opportunities for further training and experience in narrative medicine. Yes, thank you, Deepu. And Thank you for that beautiful summary of our work here. Um, uh, you know, as you said, Days is a poem that Rita Sharon brought to my very first narrative medicine workshop during master's degree orientation. And every time I hear it, something new happens. Uh, and that's creativity. Um, yeah, you know, the, for me, the acts of creative writing and performing, um, they're pleasant, they're wonderful to do, but they're not just pleasant diversions. Yeah. And, and the rigor that they demand develops muscles, uh, I would say muscles that are necessary to survive and thrive. Mm. You know, in the practice, I see clinicians, medical students, healthcare professionals, when they enter into an artistic pursuit, even if it's three minutes of writing, they experience both the joy and the rigor. And mm. they may find that they develop skills that are directly applicable to their practice. Um, making their practice go more smoothly. For example, one of my creative writing students, she's a physician, and in our playwriting class, she told me that having to take the point of view of a very difficult and challenging character in a play she was writing actually helped her better understand how to take the point of view of one of her more challenging patients in a clinic. You know, someone else said that clinicians perhaps learn to read a patient the way they learn to read a poem, mm. not to narrow it down to one meeting, but to honor the complexity of that patient, to allow room for, for that patient's many stories and the many layers of each story that we talked about before. You know, so like you, Deepu, I hope that today's session has inspired the sense of that, the, the sense that creativity, it's not just for a few artists, mm. a few trained, creatives. It, creativity dwells within us. It lodges here. It lives in us. Mm. And so for us to develop and share our creativity with other people is an essential human act. Mm. So I'm just saying, you know, 
take down a poem off the shelf or an old novel and read or, or watch a play online or even better act out a play with friends or mm. listen to music, play music, yeah. sit in front of a painting and just stare at it, write, dance. Mm. You know, engaging with creative works, whether we're viewing them or creating them ourselves, as you said, it helps us make sense and it provides us when shared with others a point of connection and it's particularly true i see in in these difficult times mm -hmm. so i hope that our session here today will help us all to pay more exquisite attention to our world and to each other and to be more creative creative more courageous mm. in representing what we see what we hear what we know and feel and experience and so to help us to form stronger bonds, to develop mm -hmm. affiliation with one another in this crucial time in our various and changing circles of life and of work. Mm. It, it's what you said, it's how we heal. It's a vital part of our lives. Um, so thanking all who participated. I did want to speak about further opportunities uh, to learn about narrative medicine and to participate in, in training if you would like. So if you would like to pursue, and I think there's a slide which will give us the, um, the website's information. If you'd like to pursue further training in narrative medicine, we offer a number of possibilities at Columbia. First of all, um, if that slide can come up, um, we'll, uh, we offer weekend workshops. We offer a certificate program in narrative medicine that can be completed online via distance learning. And we offer the Master of Science degree in narrative medicine at Columbia University. And now in an effort uh, to provide um, more support during these difficult times, uh, we're offering free narrative medicine group sessions like the one you saw here today. And you can join us several times a week and register for these sessions. To mm. register, go to narrativemedicine.blog. And for any other information, to reach us by email, narrativemedicine at columbia.edu. And so before I turn it back to you, Deepu, I would like to thank all who participated yeah. um, for the privilege of collaborating here today, and especially to thank the Gold Foundation for inviting us to be part of this important collaboration. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I also want to thank our participants and, and a special thank you for the Gold Foundation. Um, in my entire trajectory of becoming a physician from medical school onwards, the Gold Foundation has been a presence. It's been this kind of North Star uh, reminding us the true foundational purpose of healthcare, which is a humanistic connection to our patients and to one another. And uh, their leadership during this time is as, as important as ever. Um, and I, I just wanna thank Pia and the Gold Foundation for inviting us to participate um, in your uh, response uh, to the, the coronavirus pandemic um, and, and continuing to be a partner in making healthcare and health sciences education more grounded in, in humanism. Thank you. Thank you, Deepu and Catherine, for being change agents and gold ambassadors. Thank you to all of these accomplished workshop guests for joining and engaging, and to all of our viewers. I encourage each of you to please reach out to me to learn more about all our programs and collaborative webinars at the Gold Foundation. And most importantly, thank you for everything each of you do. Please take care.